and welcome to Highway. This week we're back in Wales, in the county of Gwent, for a journey down part of one of our loveliest rivers. It's the River Wye, which lends grace and beauty to town and countryside alike as it wends its way through mid and southeast Wales. It's inspired painters and poets for centuries, and tourists for almost as long. King Offa built his famous dike along part of it, and his history is as rich as the scenery. But its most memorable monument must surely be this one, Tintern Abbey. Such lovely things are yours and mine forever. The peaceful scream, the murmur of the sea. It's amazing to think that these walls have stood for 850 years. Back in the 12th century, it was the Cistercian monks who looked after the place. Today, the task falls to the head custodian of Tintin, Kate Arnott. Kate, what brought the Cistercians here in the first place? Well, I like to think of it in a way as a fresh start. Um, they were becoming disillusioned with the Benedictine way of life, and they really wanted to set up on their own. One of the most important factors in their choice of this area was that it was very, very secluded. There's the woods and the hills all the way around us. There's the river, which was a very, very important form of transport mm. for them. The land was also granted to them by Walter Fitzrichard de Clare, who was the Norman Lord of Chepstow, and he owned vast amount of lands in the area, and he would have given them this spot. So it was a combination of factors, really. So how does it feel to be custodian of one of Britain's finest monuments? Well, I'm very, very proud, of course. Um, it's an absolutely beautiful building in a wonderful area. We get an enormous amount of visitors uh, who, who come from all over the world to see the place. And I feel very, very proud to be in charge of it. Um, of course, I don't do it on my own. I've, I've got a, a team of really good staff, and it's their job to welcome visitors and answer questions on the Abbey. Um, and there's a, a lot of in administration work that has to be done, of course. Um, but there are, it, it's at odd moments, I think, more than anything, where it really um, affects me. Perhaps when I'm driving through the valley on a misty morning or coming home at night when the Abbey's floodlit at Christmas time. And I think, gosh, you know, that, that's my Abbey. I feel almost maternal about it. <laughs> <laughs> now, as a local resident, how do you feel about all the influx of travellers and tourists coming here? Well, why don't you ask my husband Julian, since he's the rector of this parish? Oh, nice to see you, sir. Now then, as I was saying to Kate, as a local resident, how do you feel about the influx of tourists here? Would you regard the tourists as sort of pilgrims? I would indeed. 
There's a certain irony, I think, that this place here, which gets about 100,000 visitors a year, what are they coming to see? In many ways, they're coming to see something that is dead. But having said that, they are coming to a spiritual site, a site with a reputation and the tradition of spirituality. And I'm convinced that a great many people have that need to come here as pilgrims, not on horseback, oh. by cars, coach, and the rest of it. Pilgrims, I would say yes. There's no worship here, so where are your churches? What churches do you have in your care? I have three parishes, Tintin, and Landogo, and Whitebrook. Why not come with me to Landogo and see an example of a living church? Fine. The days where basically country parishes were clergy graveyards, mm. you know, you had six years yeah. to go before you retired. The bungee out there. Yeah, those days are gone, thankfully. And because of the change in nature of the country parish, mm. which is not half so romantic and rustic as people might believe because of that, um, there is a new challenge in country parishes, and these, par these challenges have to be addressed. No visit to Llandogo would be complete without a look inside the village church. It's the only one in Britain dedicated to St. Odosius. There's a one we'll be going to hear a voice of the future. A year ago, Oliver Sammons was voted Choir Boy of the Year. In certain quarters, he's been hailed as the new Alec Jones. Well, here he is to sing that lovely hymn, for the beauty of the earth. Time now to meet a man who needs no convincing about the beauty of the earth hereabouts because he upsticks in London and came here to make his home in the Wye Valley instead. He is Leslie Sands. Hello, Leslie. Hello. Why did you choose to come here to live? We came to Chepstow purely on holiday. We didn't know the place at all. And we fell in love, first of all, with the people because they accepted us for what we were as people, not actors, not people from a box, a magic box and that, but just as ordinary folk. And we got on with them too well the friendliness and that we found that and the second great thing was we suddenly found that here in Chepstow you have a morning an afternoon and an evening <laughs> great, yeah. whereas where we were living in the Greater London area you had 24 hours of tension behind a steering wheel looking for somewhere to park and then being charged the earth to park there and we thought oh why not why not go for a very old-fashioned phrase now but for a quality of life which we felt we were missing out on and which I truly think we found here because we've loved every minute of it. Been here six years now. We've never regretted the move, not for a moment. Great. I know you've been married over 40 years now. What are your views on marriage? Looking back on your years. I think the proper kind of marriage is the finest anchor or cornerstone that you can have. And especially in a profession such as ours, which is so precarious, so full of all kinds of byways, temptations, if you like. 
But often the emphasis goes the wrong way. And I think to have something solid at the center of your life on which to build is terribly important. So I'm very, very grateful to marriage as an institution and in the example that I had of it, and especially in the lady I was lucky enough to marry. Pauline. Pauline, yes. Have you got some words from William Wordsworth? Tintin, isn't it? Tintin, yes. He went to France. Before he went to France, he came here. And he looked down on Tintin Abbey as a young man, full of emotional impetus. He then went to France and saw a great deal of suffering and came back and looked down again and asked himself if he had changed at all in the meantime. And if so, how? Oh, Sylvan, why? A wanderer through the woods, how often has my spirit turned to thee? And now, with gleams of half-extinguished thought, with many recognitions dim and faint, and somewhat of a sad perplexity, the picture of the mind revives again. While here I stand, not only with the sense of present pleasure, but with pleasing thoughts that in this moment there is life and food for future years. And so I dare to hope, though changed, no doubt, from what I was when first I came among these hills, when like a roe I bounded o'er the mountains by the sides of the deep rivers and the lonely streams, wherever nature led, more like a man flying from something that he dreads than one who sought the thing he loved. For nature, then, the coarser pleasures of my boyish days and their glad animal movements all gone by to me was all in all. I cannot paint what then I was. The sounding cataract haunted me like a passion. The tall rock, the mountain and the deep and gloomy wood, their colors and their forms were then to me an appetite a feeling, and a love that had no need of a remoter charm by thought supplied, or any interest unborrowed from the eye. That time is past, and all its aching joys are now no more, and all its dizzy raptures. Not for this faint eye, nor mourn, nor murmur, other gifts have followed. For such loss, I would believe, abundant recompense. Leslie, as we've heard, lives in Chepstow. And that's where we're heading now, in the company of one of our leading musical ladies, Della Jones.
Stella Jones strolling through God's garden. The gateway to this particular garden is the town of Chepstow. Its narrow streets testify to Chepstow's heritage as a market town. That's what Chepstow means. The two buildings that link modern Chepstow with its Norman origins are this parish church and the magnificent castle high above the river mouth. And it's there we go now to hear the Chepstow mill choir sing, Where Shall I Be? With a castle as grand as that, it's no surprise that Chepstow's military connections have always been strong, and they still are, although today the benefits stretch far beyond the town walls. This is St. Lawrence Hospital. Built for American soldiers wounded in World War II, it's gained a worldwide reputation for its treatment of Burns victims. Two of the many thousand people who have been restored to health by the plastic surgeons here are Barry Durbin and Russell Adams. Barry was badly burned in an electrical accident at work. Russell received severe injuries, trying to rescue his wife and children from a house fire last year. We were in hospital just over eight weeks. Um, that incorporated the time spent in intensive care and the short time that we were on Powys Ward, which is a convalescing ward for uh, Burns patients. So how did you feel the day you left? Absolutely terrified. Oh, yeah. You become a part of a family that... Um, is made up of nurses and doctors and consultants and whatnot, but uh, you do get a false sense of security. And uh, I was terrified. Now, Barry, you formed What's Next. Yes. So tell us about it. It's, it's just a group of people, um, uh, experienced patients, uh, ex-plastic surgery patients, and professional people who got together to, uh, basically to give support and help two people yeah. who don't receive it. Um, there's no, the hospital doesn't give any psychological report. Um, the job is support, to patch you up. Just to patch you up, yeah. and then you are left on your own. So That's hopefully the, our job will be to yeah. give support and help everybody come back into the community. So as soon as people accept that uh, they are um, burnt, disfigured, uh, the easier it is then for them to come to terms with it and reintegrate into the community. The hospital's military role may have passed, but here they are training the soldiers of the future. How many of you, I wonder, have driven over the Severn Bridge and asked yourselves what goes on in these strange-looking buildings? 
Well, now's your chance to find out. And the founder of the college, Captain Roger Hall, is the man to tell us. Roger, what exactly goes on here at the college? Uh, this is an engineering college where we train uh, marine engineers and engineers, and there are about 16 trades that, that the lads learn here. How long do they stay? They stay some for 18 months and others for about two years. So how much formal religious instruction do the boys get? Um, they come, they have six terms here. We challenge them with all sorts of different things, look at them, um, morality, ethics, how to be a Christian, death, dying, um, and all these different things. And, and I hope that at the end of the time here, they began to put together what it is they, they believe in. So we start with James. Uh, why did you join the army? To travel, to meet new people, to learn a trade. Uh, there's loads of opportunities on here, sports. You got confirmed recently, didn't you? Yeah. So how do you think your faith will serve you as a soldier? It means a lot. It means someone there, the hour of need, friendship, happiness. I go to Northern Ireland, someone, yeah. something to look up to. You got backup. <laughs> <laughs> And Mark, what's life like here for you at Beachley? Oh, great. Enjoy most aspects of the training, especially my trade. I like mixing with the lads my own age, and the sporting opportunities are brilliant. And as a Christian soul, do you think it makes you different from the other lads at all? Oh, no, not whatsoever. My belief, they, they respect that. So, how do you reconcile being an active Christian with being a soldier? First of all, I think I want to say that we're not a crusading army. We're not out to plunder lands and do things like that. We're a protective force. Peacekeeping Peacekeeping force. Peacekeeping yeah. force. And I think that Jesus always told us to try and stand by those who are least able to help themselves. So, for example, going into Bosnia and Yugoslavia um, is to help those who are least able to stand for themselves. And that's a very Christian principle, I think. The fact that there are two chapels on site underlines the importance placed on the pastoral side of the apprentice's life here. And you couldn't wish for a more beautiful place in which to worship than this one. Well, that's it for this week's highway. Now it's off back up the M4 to Newbury for next week's highway. See you then.
If you're looking for sparkling conversation, laughter, music and tip-top entertainment, join Des O'Connor and a galaxy of stars. Wednesdays at 8 on HTV. Faith and Bill hope that Richard and Marjorie have second thoughts after the break.